The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection with Al Page. Our guest is renowned guitarist Charlie Bird. If I understand things right, the first music you were exposed to was country. Your dad, your uncle, black blues players. Was that right? Well, let me see now. We were in the country. <laughs> uh, music didn't have all the labels then that it has now. My father played the mandolin and I uh, played the guitar, both. And he played what would now be called country music. And he played um, a lot of blues on the guitar. He played primarily blues. Played for square dances. I guess that's country. And I played some popular tunes and some Italian songs. So, you know, he played whatever he thought he could get away with. And but I, basically, I guess you could say it was country. And on the weekend, black blues players came in. What was that about? Well, it was a, it, my, father ran, uh, my father and his father before him ran country stores, small town stores. So they are very uh, social places, you know. So whatever kind of singing and picking and dancing is going on, that's where it happens, and uh, in a community like that, it was uh, a total mixture of black and white. It was not a, that was about the only place that wasn't segregated. When people played the guitar then, did they use a pick, their fingers? Uh, were there no rules? Did anything go? Uh, the, traditional, uh, the traditional blues players before that time, black and white, played with the, just the fingers. But uh, as I was coming along, the uh, plectrum had uh, started, to be, started to be popular, and I wanted to do that because it was hip. So my first, my first guitar playing was done with, with the plectrum. I understand that came about uh, when the banjo, the banjo was inter introduced into the jazz bands, and then uh, when the microphone started in the recording, they, they decided they liked the sound of the guitar better in the ensemble. So a lot of those banjo players switched to guitar. Hmm. Eddie Condon was basically a banjo player, you know, and so they played the, he played the tenor guitar and he played it with a pick just like he would a banjo. He said that there were essentially no rules with respect to the kind of music we called blues or the kind of music that we called country. Are there particular rhythms associated with what we might call country or blues? Well, there's, there's more than one rhythm. There's, uh, you know, the, there's the uh, there's the square dance rhythm, which is like a really two beat sort of thing, and then there's the the blues. Can Can you show us a little bit? You have a, I have a sense of what well, that's I'll, about. I'll show you. Uh, I don't play. I never learned to play those square dance tunes. That's except, why I asked you. Except for except to play the accompaniments. You know, you play uh, those kind of things. Just nice little ones. Forever, you know, if somebody booked a job on Saturday night, he'd invite all his friends to come and play because there was no drums and so it was just a bunch of kids sitting around playing the guitar like that. And how did the blues differ? This I'd play a blues tune my father used to play. That's terrific. Did your father have a different technique than the black blues players that he was listening to? Well, he learned from them, you know. It was pretty, very similar. The type of music that was played in the South and the Southeast, was it regional in nature? Could you tell, for example, if the guitar music was from Memphis, Tennessee, or New Orleans, compared to Norfolk or areas that you hung around? Well, by the time I came along, the records were having a big influence. Mm -hmm. You know, the, like the black players that, uh, that I grew up with and listened to play, they all, they learned a lot of what they knew from records. So it was, the, uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't so regionally divided as it probably was at an earlier time. When you were young, you quickly got interested in jazz. Why jazz? I don't know, it was a time for jazz, you know? I mean, the kids that I was in school with and all the, the, uh, the big, that was uh, the big band era was starting and uh, that was uh, popular music on the radio. 
What was the first jazz that you heard? You know, the way you, the way you played that blues sound sounded pretty jazzy to me. Well, I'm curious what the, well, what well, the difference was. Well, I mean, I, I wasn't trying to, to play that exactly like my father did. You know, mm -hmm. I, I probably could, but I, that would take a lot of thought. There was a lot of what I do connected with that. Uh, well, actually, my father played some jazz tunes as well. He played, you know, some tunes that he knew, like the Wang Wang Blues. I remember he played that. That was an old Dixieland tune. Uh, the first uh, group I ever played with that, that was something like jazz was a group from William, William and Mary College. And uh, I got a summer engagement with them uh, to play at a hotel at Virginia Beach. And that was the, I guess that's the first time I played with a band that had saxophones and trumpets and stuff, and I got sort of hooked on it. Now, were you making up your stuff as you went along, or were you undergoing formal training? I uh, I never had any formal training at all at that time. I uh, I did know how to read music though. I mean, I learned to read music in public school, and I figured out how to uh, transfer that to the guitar. I, I don't mean I was a whiz of a reader, but I could read a part. Can you give us an example of the type of early pieces that you were messing around with? I remember the first tune I played on the radio when I was about. 11 or 12 years old, when I had a solo to play, I can I write mm -hmm. it's a tune called Trouble in Mind. Here is now Charlie Bird, 11 years old, playing <laughs> Trouble in Mind. This is blues too. nicely, quietly. Yes. Now one thing maybe we should explain before we get too involved in, in what I do is that I made a decision uh, later on that I wanted to learn to play the classical guitar. And this is after World War II in New yes, York? Yes, that's right. And uh, mm -hmm. so everything that I'm doing now, I'm doing as a classical player would do, it, would do it. But I was a flat picker in those days. I played everything with a mm -hmm. flat pick. Who got you interested in classical music? Was it a roommate? Well, not really. I had I had a I was had a roommate that I uh, was rooming with in New York. There was a clarinet player, and he had a lot of uh, books around, and he was very interested in classical music. and And I had I had started uh, being interested in classical music as a listener, not as a player. You're listening to records. Yeah, well, records and going to concerts and things. And uh, and it was while I was with him I had these uh, uh, Bach and and handle pieces there, and I started to uh, work on some of them from the piano parts. And I had never heard of Segovia, mm -hmm. but uh, shortly after that, he, he came in one day, and I was playing, and, uh, and I said, hey, you know, this, this music doesn't sound bad played on the guitar. And he said, well, of course it doesn't. Have you never heard Segovia play this <laughs> transcription? So I went out and educated myself. And you spent a summer with Segovia? Yes. What was that like? That was absolutely marvelous. Mm -hmm. I. Uh, before that, I, I tried, I did a little studying in uh, New York. I started to uh, wanting, wanting to uh, know more about the guitar than I could figure out myself. So I got in touch with the Guitar Society there, uh, which were a wonderful group of people. And I even had a few lessons with Ray De La Torre, who was a Cuban guitar player that came along at that time. and. Uh, he was a very busy teacher, and I was uh, I was more I was a more rank beginner than I thought I was. <laughs> so I eventually uh, heard about this teacher in Washington D.C., Sophocles Pappas, and that's how I came to uh, live there. I went down to study with him because he was, at that time, the only classical guitar teacher in the United States approved for study under the GI Bill. So that's why I went to Washington. And then you spent that summer with Segovia. How did Segovia teach? When I was there, it was still a small class. Mm -hmm. I think there were 17 of us. And 
we took, uh, we would have a lesson in rotation, and we had discussed by mail some of the uh, repertoire that would be acceptable, and you came up and you played for him, and he told you what you were doing wrong, uh, right, and, uh, and he would have a uh, lesson with him, and then it would be someone else's turn, and you would all get to watch that. So was he tough? Was he easy? Well, he was. Uh, the level of playing was uh, quite varied. John Williams was there. Alirio Diaz was there. Rodrigo Riera. There were some wonderful players there. He was tough on them. He wasn't so <laughs> tough on me. <laughs> Here you came up out of the blues tradition, the jazz tradition. Did you have to retrain yourself? Of course. I mean, the whole uh, the whole technique is different. You know, the classical guitar is just fingers, and and uh, with on the Segovia's uh, school, there's some nail involved in the sound, and the whole sound production is is totally different than the way I began. Can you give us an example? Well. a single note thing, you know, whereas, uh, you know, ordinary, uh, when I play with a pick, I didn't even think about getting the sound that way. This is almost like, it's almost like a vocalist, you know, you have to really, you have to practice a lot to make those notes come out that way. And make the guitar sound. Did it involve a different mental approach too? Did you have mentally approach well, what you're still doing? Invo that's still evolving. <laughs> but what I started to say when we uh, turned the corner back there a while ago was that I decided a long time ago to use this technique for playing everything that I played. So I play jazz this way, I play blues. With the, it's all with this technique. Even though I consider myself a good blues player, if, if someone asks me my opinion, I think I play the blues very well. I do it with a classical guitarist technique, although I've, um, I have tried to learn some of the things that the great blues players do. I knew some of them personally. I knew Josh White very well, and I've heard a lot of good blues players, and I tried to use some of the way they bend notes and all that, but basically I tried to do it with, uh, with the kind of sound out of the guitar that a classical player gets. If I understand things right, you came to a point in your career when you decided you were not going to be a great classical player. I think that's true, yeah. Now, how did that come about? Well, I, I guess it was a little, uh, you could call it soul searching. I had, uh, I had been very serious about learning to play uh, jazz on the guitar and uh, decided that that was going to be my life's work. And then I sort of switched and decided that uh, I really wanted to know something about the classical guitar, and I and I uh, worked at it. Uh, I was devoted to it, and I worked very hard at it. I still do. You know, this is uh, 30, 40 years later. But uh, I realized that I had gotten a late start on on what was required, both technically and mentally, and everything to to really be. Uh, in a world class doing that kind of playing, even though the competition in those days wasn't nearly what it is now. You know, now the woods are full of kids that can really play the classical guitar. But I decided that uh, I would uh, have a better chance of success if I used all my own experience. And I, my life experience at that time had been, uh, a lot of it had, had been towards the uh, jazz feel and, I, and my experience in it. So I decided to combine my experiences and it, and it was a, it, it worked. It was a workable thing. You talk about combining all your experiences. So far we've talked about classical, jazz, uh, the blues, but a big part of your career has been Latin American music. So you were off to doing something else. How did that come about? Well, I, was, I always liked Latin American music. I, th I think if you're serious about the guitar, you eventually come to Latin American, Spanish and Latin American music because that's, uh, the guitar is so important to those people culturally. And uh, my first introduction to uh, 
to uh, Latin American music was in New York when I played with some Puerto Rican and Cuban bands there. There was a time when uh, it became popular for the uh, bands on Nora Morales and Machito and big orchestras like that, recorded with the great jazz player, recorded with Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. And there was a definite uh, amalgamation of, of Latin music and jazz going on at all levels. You know, I didn't get to record with Nora Morales, but I played on the, played with Cuban bands playing for Saturday Night Dancing, you know, with the same effect. They would, they would just play and let me wail. Give us a little sense of Saturday Night with a Cuban band. They would let us, let us play, you know, the bluesy or however we wanted to, and they would they, fill they, around you. Yeah. I even I even did a little stint with Catherine Dunham, the dancer. You got interested in the music of Antonio Carlos Jobim. What was interesting about his music? Well, I with uh, well, I like the kind of I like the style of it, the bossa nova rhythms, and I just, I think he's a great songwriter. I think he's. Uh, uh, I think he's the, uh, my favorite songwriter for the second half of the 20th century. No. Give, a, give or take Michel Legrand or a few others. There are a lot of stories about the music we call bossa nova with respect to how it started. How did it start? Well, it started in Brazil, I guess. Uh, uh, Joe Beam and uh, Jorge Alberto and Caimi and all, all of these people who were there who were uh, musicians and who were uh, who had some interest in American songs and jazz. And so I think they made the amalgamation. I didn't, you know, I found, I found these, uh, these songs that were structured with uh, some uh, nodding towards the American popular song, sort of intact, you know. The, and we call Bossa Nova New Wrinkle, is that essentially how you a translate? A new hump, a new, Wrinkle, something like that. Yeah. Can you give us a sense of what that beat is, a Joe Bin song? Well, it's basically a, it's a, it's a samba beat. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's like uh, it's one of the soft versions of the samba that, that uh, it's been around in Brazil for a long time. It's Play the, a Joe Bin yeah. song that you like. All right. Mm -hmm. played a lot of different kinds of music from blues to classical on the guitar. Do songs sound differently depending on which guitar you're playing them on? I play everything I play on this one. Uh, you could, I mean, you know, I guess you could, you could reckon that uh, the blues would sound, sound better on a steel string guitar. The, the notes bend a little differently. My father never liked this guitar for playing the blues. He said it doesn't, doesn't cry enough. I understand, though, that you've owned up to 25 different guitars. Is that I right? Something like that, yeah. But they're not all, they're all the same type. They're, uh, well, basically. I have some well, basically. Pitch, yeah. <laughs> so how do they differ? Why do you have 25 different guitars? Well, I can't bear to part with them. You know, they'll, they'll become like my children. I can't, I can't give them up once I have them. 
And, uh, you know, so I buy some and I wear some out. Guitars wear out, you know, they don't last forever. How do they wear out? The, uh, the, the principle of the guitar is uh, this bridge rocks, and that's what makes the vibration. And, and it's just a bridge glued to the top of this thin piece of uh, uh, spruce, and it's uh, got bracing inside. And so it's uh, very much like if you took a, something like a piece of paper like this, it would eventually fatigue it. And the same thing happens to a guitar top. Could you see in a line ten guitars, like two of them, and want to throw eight away into the garbage? Well, I don't know quite that, but there would be a difference. There's no two alike. You know, the guitar, this is a factory guitar, but you know, among very fine classical guitars, you, you go into a maker and you try a dozen, and not, everyone has different characteristics. With respect to your contemporaries who play guitar, do people have favorites? Do people argue about this model versus that model? Well, I don't argue because I think uh, it's an individual choice. You know, nowadays uh, uh, the guitar has had such a renaissance, such an explosion of all phases of the guitar, including uh, luthiers that make guitars, that uh, you can find one that suits your needs. So, I, you know, it's not, it's not something to quarrel about. It's, it's personal choice. It's, it's like I wouldn't argue with someone about the suit they were wearing. <laughs> That's the suit you like? Wear it, you know? In Latin America and South America, do the people have favorite types of guitars that they like to use to play their own music? They do. I mean, for instance, the Brazilians make some very nice guitars. And then uh, when I first started uh, communicating with them, their guitars weren't made for this climate. So the, uh, you know, the Brazilian guitarists would come up here and, uh, and stay about two weeks and open the case one day, there would be a pile of sticks inside. The whole thing is it falling apart because the humidity wasn't ready for uh, the, the, uh, the uh, heated houses and dry heat we have here. You've had a long time interest in that music and another composer uh, that you're interested in is Villa Lobos. Uh, how does his music differ from Jobim? Well, Villa Lobos is a classical composer. I guess you'd have to, that's, that's really not really the right word, but we'll use that. He's serious, that's also not the right <laughs> word. Uh, but he, Villa Lobos, was a, a musician who played the guitar. Everyone in Brazil plays the guitar some way. You know, you go to a party and mm. when I finish, I hand it over here and it just goes around. And everybody can play a little bit. And Villa Lobos is quite a good player. And, uh, and he was a composer. He's written a lot of orchestral things, a lot of uh, unusual combinations and, and some music for the guitar. He started writing music for the guitar in 1912 or something like that. And then when he met Segovia in the late 20s, that inspired him to uh, do a whole new batch of things. Can you play us a little Villa Lobos, have a sure. sense of what he's about? I'll play, uh, I'll play a thing of his that's based on a Russian theme. <laughs> just about at the end of the show. How about taking us out with some more playing? Whatever you want. Okay. Uh, Gershwin piece? Something that, like I love Gershwin. <laughs>
To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org classics.